For the next part of this lecture, we're going to talk about niches or niches, which is each species way of living, its lifestyle. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about how species interaction affect the community structure and the ecosystem. So if you think about the moth living on the sloth, back from part one, the niche of that moth is that it needs to live in sloth fur, it needs to lay its eggs in sloth poop, um, the larvae eat sloth poop, that's all part of its niche, okay? Um, and yes, you can say it either niche or niche. A lot of people feel very strongly about one or the other, but there's no one accepted pronunciation. All right, so the niche of each, each organism is the space it requires, the type and amount of food it eats, what it eats, so what organisms consider it uses for food. Now, of course, if this is, if we're talking about a plant with a niche, then it doesn't consume other organisms. It's going to create its own food. Its influence on competitors when it reproduces, how long it takes for it to reproduce, where it reproduces, and then what kind of temperature it can handle and how much moisture it needs. Can it survive in a desert or does it need to be uh, in a very wet environment like a swamp? A lot of organisms depend on other organisms. And in fact, they force each other to evolve in certain specific ways. We call this co-evolution, where two things evolve to rely on each other and then evolve together. So this is an example. This is a long-tubed orchid. This is the orchid flower here. Uh, and this is a long-tongued tongued moth that pollinates this orchid. And both of these depend on the other for their lifestyle. This moth has developed this incredibly long tongue that you can see here. And this tongue is long enough to, that when the moth gets its face into this orchid, this tongue can reach all the way back down here to the root of this flower, where this flower makes nectar, which is just sugar water that feeds the moth. And the flower does this because the moth is gonna help pollinate these flowers. So you see this stuff here, these are the male parts of the flowers, what we call the anther, that produce the pollen. So when this moth feeds on this flower, it gets its face stuck into these anthers and it gets pollen on its face. Also here in the flower are the female parts of the flower, um, the stamen, and the uh, moth, when it goes to the next flower, hopefully on another plant, it is going to get its face into the pollen again, but rub some of the pollen off into the female part of the flower. And that, uh, that transfer of pollen is then going to uh, fertilize the eggs within this flower. So the flower has evolved to have its nectar way back here. So the only thing that can fertilize it, the only thing that can get to its pollen is this moth. And the moth has developed this really long tongue so that it can get to this pollen. Why does that benefit them both? The moth doesn't have to share this food source with any other organisms because nothing else can get its tongue back here to get to that pollen. So it's got a secure food source as long as these orchids are around. And the orchid, because it isn't attracting a lot of different kinds of pollinators, it's not going to get pollen from other plants on its reproductive parts. So it's only going to be pollinated by itself. So that's a really important force that has shaped both the flower and the moth. And that's a, an example of co-evolution. And we see that actually a lot. Here's an example from our local mountains. Um, this is a plant called the yucca. And you normally see it as these sort of balls of spiky uh, leaves uh, that are really, really uh, tough and sharp. And then in the springtime, when these plants uh, bloom, they only bloom once in their life, they put up this gigantic stalk that's covered with these little tiny white flowers. Those flowers have to be pollinated by this little moth called the California yucca moth. And this moth 
lays its eggs inside the flowers. So here's a female moth inside the flower. She's gonna lay her eggs here. And what she does when she does that is not only does she carry pollen from one flower to another, but then as she lays her eggs, she actually jumps up and down on the eggs to make sure that they get forced down into the ovary of the flower. And the flower has evolved to depend on that force from the moth to get the uh, pollen down to the eggs. And uh, the moth has evolved to require the flower for the moth's larvae to, uh, to survive. They're gonna then feed on the developing flower as they grow up. So uh, that is an example of a really tight coevolution that you see in our local mountains. So whenever it's, we've had a nice rain year, you'll see lots of this little, these little white stalks, and that's gonna be the flowering parts of the yucca. And even after a, a big fire, which is what this is, you can still see some of the plants are able to put up a flowering stalk and reproduce. So competition is what happens when niches overlap and two different organisms are trying to use the same resources. There are two things that can result from competition, either competitive exclusion, which is where one species utilizes the resources more efficiently and is able to outcompete the other one, or resource partitioning, where each species alters its use of the niche and they end up dividing the resources. Competitive exclusion makes sense. One species essentially wins the battle and the other one has to move to another area or something. Resource partitioning can actually shape the uh, phenotype of the organisms involved. When it does that, we say that character displacement has happened. So we've literally displaced or changed the character of the organism. So this is an example from some of the finches in the Galapagos Islands. These are the finches that Darwin studied. And there's been a research group uh, led by uh, Richard and Rosemary Grant studying these birds for I think the last 40 or 50 years. So here's an example of character displacement as a result of competition. Here are these two finches and they both sort of have kind of medium sized beaks uh, when they live on islands where they're the only species that's trying to eat these seeds. So they have these medium-sized beaks, they can eat the large seeds and the small seeds. On another island, both birds live. So on either of these islands, only one species lives. On the center island, both species of this bird live. When they're both competing for all of the seeds, neither does well. So what has happened is that in one species, the birds with bigger beaks were able to monopolize the bigger seeds and they passed on that gene for bigger beaks. For the other species, birds with smaller beaks were able to monopolize the smaller seeds. So they ended up depending on the smaller seeds. So we see this species is still the same species of birds, and this species is still the same species of birds, but they look different on different islands. So they have more of a medium sized beak on the island that they don't have to share, and then their beaks are distinct on the island where they do have to share. So if this bird, this individual bird, were to travel to this island, it would then mate with birds with this medium sized beak and it might it would pass on this gene for larger beaks but the birds that have a medium sized beak they're actually going to have more food available to them because they can eat both kinds of seeds so it might actually be better more advantageous to have a medium sized beak whereas the medium sized beak birds on this island they're going to be competing with these birds that can focus entirely on the small seeds so they might not be and they might not be able to eat some of the larger seeds and so they might not actually do as well on this island where they have to share 
So that's resource partitioning, where these two bird species have essentially partitioned this resource of food with one relying on the larger and one relying on the smaller. And again, remember that these changes happen over many generations. All right, predation is a form of one organis organism eating another organism. I'm gonna put this up uh, in Canvas so that you can see these um, videos. I'm not gonna play them for you right now. Uh, they don't play well when I'm trying to record. Uh, but one of these is an insect eating a mammal. Yes, that's actually a thing. Uh, and the other is uh, a cephalopod eating a shark. So they're both kind of amazing videos. And we, you can see in both of these that the presence of predators can affect the uh, evolution of the prey animals. The prey that's available is also going to affect the predator. So they're both going to uh, shape the evolution of the other organism. There are a lot of ways that organisms have evolved to defend themselves against predation. One of those is just a physical defense, such as in this case, these sharp spines of the Cape porcupine. Uh, it's really hard for a predator to eat a porcupine because it has because the porcupine has these really sharp long quills, and um, the porcupine can just turn its back on a predator. And it then is very hard for the predator to, to attack and eat the porcupine. Porcupines but don't, by the way, shoot their quills into other things. But the quills do have little spines that face backwards. So if a quill gets into another animal, it'll like sort of work its way deeper into the animal. The way that uh, predators have figured out to eat porcupines is you just flip the pet porcupine over and bite into the tummy sack, which is soft. Uh, chemical defenses. This is an example of a toxic frog. It's called a poison dart frog because the people uh, in the rainforest of Central America, where these frogs live, they use blow darts to hunt with, and they coat the tip of their darts in the toxin from this frog, and it's a neurotoxin, and it paralyzes prey. So they can then shoot those poisoned blow darts at prey, and it makes the... Uh, humans more effective hunters. Now a lot of organisms that do have toxins in their body uh, show that by having warning coloration. For, so for example, this is a monarch butterfly uh, and it's orange which acts as a signal to predators to say, I do not taste good. Now this coloration isn't directly linked to the toxin. The toxin doesn't make the organism orange. What happens is that some individuals develop bright colors and those bright colored organisms don't get eaten and they can afford to be brightly colored. Okay, so it's a subtle difference. Um, now, other organisms may end up looking like the brightly colored organism uh, because of chance, but that then protects the non-toxic organism. So imagine that there's a bunch of these butterflies around and a bird eats one of these butterflies. And for either the butterfly tastes really bad or the butterfly makes the bird sick. That bird is then not going to want to eat orange butterflies. So another orange butterfly gets protected, not by being toxic itself, but by looking like the toxic organism. And then another form of defense is camouflage. Now what we're seeing here, this is a praying mantis that looks a lot like this stick that it's sitting on. This praying mantis is both prey for larger organisms, but it's also a predator. So camouflage can be effective for predators and prey. This uh, praying mantis's prey by sitting and waiting for their prey to come along. The prey doesn't see them because the mantis looks just like the plant that it's sitting on. And then the the mantis pounces on the prey and eats it. But that camouflage also works for prey, making the prey harder to see as well. 
Other defenses, uh, run away and hide um, is always a good defense. Uh, so uh, fish uh, in, a sh in a school, are it's harder for a predator to see an individual uh, fish, for example, in a school. And uh, the fish in the school can signal to each other to run away. So it actually helps them uh, survive. The other thing is that a lot of organisms fight back, uh, some ways, sometimes in physical fighting and sometimes in doing gross things that make the predator back off. For example, for this example, a bird um, vomiting on an intruder, which does sometimes just make a predator say, you know what, no, I don't want to eat that, that's disgusting, and the predator goes away. So there are lots of different forms of defense against predation that have been shaped by evolution in this continuing battle between predators and prey. Now parasitism is another form of predation in which one organism feeds off another organism while living either on or within that second organism, which we call the parasite's host. Um, host sounds like the other organism invited the, pre the parasite in, which didn't happen, but that's the terminology that we use. Um, parasites do have the ability to change the behavior of their host to increase the chance that the parasite get pa gets passed along to a ne the next host. A lot of parasites need to go into uh, multiple organisms in order to complete their lifestyle, uh, their life cycle. So they can, uh, many parasites have actually uh, evolved ways to change the brain of the host to change that host's behavior. Some parasites can actually make zombies out of their hosts uh, in order to force the host to do something that will then cause the parasite to get passed on. So there's another couple of videos for you to watch that are totally amazing. Symbiotic relationships are really interesting of uh, a place where niches overlap. These are often beneficial relationships, although per, uh, parasitism is another form of a symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic just means living with, literally bio, life, and sim with. So anytime that two organisms depend on each other for life or one depends on another, that's a symbiotic relationship. In mutualism, both species gain from the relationship. So here's an example of a coral. This is a coral individual and this is an individual coral. Um, and these spots in the coral are actually algae, photosynthetic algae that live within the tissues of the coral. The coral is an animal, by the way. Uh, this, the algae benefits by getting a secure home uh, in the coral. The coral benefits because the algae share some of the sugars that they have made through photosynthesis. So this is a mutual, a mutualistic relationship where both organisms benefit by having niches that overlap. Um, another example are plants that have a nitrogen fixing fungi that live around their roots. When we talk about fixing, we're talking about putting a a, a, a atom or molecule into a form that is more useful for another organism. So carbon fixation, uh, fungi that fix carb, uh, sorry, nitrogen, uh, they can take uh, nitrogen from the air, nitrogen gas, which is a form that plants and animals can't use, and they put it into a molecular form that animals and plants can use. So uh, the plants give the fungi a place to live and share some of their nutrients with the fungi and the fungi share the nitrogen in a form that the plant can use. So that's another mutualistic relationship. Termites have cellulose digesting microbes within their digestive systems. And again, uh, the, the microbes get a safe environment with a constant food supply from the termite and the termite gets nutrients broken down from the cellulose by the microbes. So again, there's mutualism, both are benefiting. And then one of my favorites is lichen. And when you start to look around, you're gonna see lichen all over the place. Lichen kind of looks like moss. This is a moss here, except that moss is an actual plant with leaves. You have to look really, really carefully. If you see something like this, that sort of looks like leaves, but 
kind of doesn't, that's likely a lichen. And a lichen is actually a fungus with photosynthetic either bacteria or algae living inside of it. A lot of lichens uh, don't, the, the fungus and the photosynthetic organism don't live separately at all. They only exist as a mutualistic partnership. Kind of cool. Now, another form of symbiotic relationship is commensalism, where one organism gains and the other doesn't gain or lose. It doesn't affect the other organism at all. So here's an example of egrets, which is this bird right here. They tend to uh, hang out with wild cows or domestic cattle. And they very often sit on the cattle um, at a, a, so they have a higher vantage point to see around. What they're looking for though is, are insects that get stirred up by the cattle walking around and eating grass. So from their vantage point up here, the egrets can see the insects that fly up off the ground as the cattle move around. And then the egrets can eat the insects. It doesn't affect the cattle at all. The egret doesn't weigh enough to affect the cattle and the cattle wasn't, weren't going to eat the insects anyway. So this doesn't affect the cattle at all, but the, e the egret gains a lot. That's commensalism. Another one is clownfish that live amongst the uh, tendrils of anemones. The anemone does not care whether the clownfish is there or not. It doesn't benefit the anemone at all. Doesn't also doesn't harm the anemone. The clownfish is protected by the anemone. And the anemone is like, yeah, whatever. I can still eat, you know, other prey comes along and I can eat that. And so if you want to hang out here, that's fine. Now, one organism that has a big effect on other organisms around is called a keystone species. And just like the keystone in an arch, uh, if you take that keystone out, the whole arch falls down. A keystone species, if you remove that species, then the whole ecosystem can fall apart. Bison, it turns out, are a keystone species for prairie grasslands. It turns out that when you return bison to prairies, the number of other species that can exist in that, in that prairie greatly increases. They prevent any one kind of grass from taking over. And by walking around and um, reforming the ground as they walk around, they actually create uh, niches for other organisms. Also, sea stars uh, are a really important species in the intertidal zone uh, because they eat mussels. Uh, so let's look at what that one looks like. So here is a healthy tidal zone. And you see we've got sea stars, we've got some mussels, we've got lots of other things. We've got little chitons and sea anemones and algae. We've got a, little snails. We've got a bunch of things that live in this intertidal zone. If you take the sea stars away, then the mussels start to reproduce really, really fast. And they are actually able to outcompete other organisms for space and food. They're, such, they're so good at reproducing and outcompeting other organisms that they just take over. And so without the sea stars to eat the mussels, you get these areas where it's just mussels and nothing else living in the intertidal. So just re taking away the sea stars takes away all of these other organisms because they need the sea stars to eat the mussels so that the mussels don't outcompete everyone else. So that's why sea stars are a keystone species in the intertidal. Another keystone species are sea otters. The kelp forests really depend on sea otters to keep the kelp forest healthy. Without sea otters, uh, sea urchins overeat the kelp and uh, they will end up actually destroying the, all the kelp beds. The kelp is really, really important for other organisms uh, such as uh, small sea slugs and snails that live in the kelp, but also lots and lots of fish lay their eggs and live as young among the kelp because there are lots of hiding places for small fish to stay away from larger fish. 
So it's a really important what we call nursery for fish because small fish can sit and grow up protected in the kelp forest and then leave the kelp forest when they get older and their, uh, their size protects them from some predators. So what we've seen off the coast of California is as we've restored sea otter species, we see this whole ecosystem of the kelp forest that has become far more vibrant and helped the health of the coastal oceans altogether. So that's another important keystone species. That's the end of this lecture, and I will post something new next week, and I hope you have enjoyed this. Have a great day.